Hello and welcome to Composer's Lab, Session 2, Johann Sebastian Bach. I am your host, Sergei Kosenko, and on behalf of Interactive Academy, we are welcoming you to this second session. Johann Sebastian Bach, when we think of that name, um, many musicians agree that um, he is kind of like at the helm of uh, professional music development. There were many composers before Bach. Um, he was definitely not the first professional composer. As a matter of fact, um, we can say that professional music started perhaps with the invention of the five-line staff. Just imagine walking on a sandy beach and um, just drawing out your palm of your hand and, and just drawing those five lines in the sand and then uh, putting the notes in. And that's probably what happened in the town of Arezzo uh, about year 1000 AD when um, a monk by the name of Guido um, came up not with the idea of using the staff but with the idea of standardizing first of all a uh, five-line staff and second of all the solfege do re mi fa sol la si or ti uh, to actually have names for each note and and what that did is that music could now be written with um, pretty good precision as opposed to using, let's say, symbolic notation for certain figures um, of, of, of chanting or singing, now you could actually write the notes like what we just heard from Bach. You know, this is thousands of notes um, that are played per hour, let's say. Um, and what happens is that when the composer passes that on, of course, uh, we start building a legacy, not unlike that in literature, and uh, theater. So Bach actually uh, took all of that and, and kind of synthesized in a way what was before him and, and probably saw into the future. In fact, in his own time, his music was deemed to be too difficult, too difficult to play, too difficult to listen to. Um, we have accounts that, that tell us that the singers would complain sometimes that uh, he wrote his chorales so, so intricately that they, they wouldn't even know when to come in in, in that piece. Um, but um, let's just uh, look at Bach's life and, and, and what happened to him. So I have some interesting uh, pictures for you. This one is actually a stamp. It's, um, it's a vintage stamp with, of course, the house. Bach's house, and, and uh, I don't know who the painter is of the portrait, but I've actually seen it before. So this stamp was a commemorative stamp, and uh, somebody actually runs uh, a website called Bach on Bach. His name is Peter Bach, and he's, uh, uh, I'm sure, a distant relative. So he um, finds these unique little pieces and uh, takes photographs of them and actually lets us use them as long as we uh, thank him for his work. So we do thank him for his work. Um, now, Bach was born uh, in Germany when you look at, um, let's say, this map of Germany. Um, you see, this is modern borders of Germany. You see where Berlin is, of course, in the northeast. And then, then you have um, Frankfurt, which is a big um, industrial city, of course, Hamburg in the north. And then where Bach was born is actually right there. Right in the middle, um, the um, province that's called uh, Thuringen, uh, the city or town of Eisenach. And he comes from a musical family. His father was a violinist, in fact, employed in, in, um, in the church, I believe. So his first music inspirations came from his family. Um, his parents died when he was very young. And then one of his older brothers um, took care of him. And, and, and then we have these accounts to, to where Bach actually discovered this cabinet full of sheet music. And, and back then they actually rolled it in rolls. So he sees these rolls of sheet music and there was just enough space for him. It was locked, just enough space for him to get in there, unlock the door or sneak in and, and get the sheet music and study it and copy it in the candlelight. And, and that's how he studied. Uh, well, later, um, 
just a little later, he was actually still a young boy. He, he was progressing very well on the violin as well as keyboard instruments, which at that time were organ and harpsichord. The piano was not yet invented. However, we will see that it was in fact invented during Bach's lifetime. And moreover, he was actually one of the first what we would call today beta testers, believe it or not, of, of the, the original piano fortes from Bartholomew Cristofori. Uh, who was uh, starting to manufacture those. Um, but his, in his early years, some of his biggest inspirations came from the organists. Um, there was an organist in his town called uh, George Bohm, and uh, he learned a lot from him, I'm sure. But then there was another organist who, um, when Bach was 20 or so, uh, that organist was in his late 60s, and his name is Dietrich Buxtehude. Now, Buxtehude may not be well known today, but back in the day, he was, um, you know, one of those um, pretty much big composers who could pull a big crowd. He was a great improviser on the organ, and he also wrote music for big orchestras. In fact, there's this one account that says that um, Bach actually traveled on foot, and uh, we're going to still look on the same map and then see where he traveled. He traveled to Lübeck, uh, and, and that would be in mileage over 200 miles, in fact. So he um, traveled to Lübeck to hear um, Buxtehude's concerts, and one of the concerts, uh, we are told, actually employed multiple organs, that is pipe organs, more than one in the same concert, several choirs, drums, trumpets, and other brass instruments, and the, the violin section alone was 25 players. And you know, by today's standards, actually 25 violins is a pretty big symphony orchestra, like Hollywood style, you know, so back then it would have been just gigantic. And so Bach, actually, um, it was time well spent for him because not only he met Buxtehude, um, it is said that he probably might have even participated in some of the performances. And uh, when he came back to, um, at the time he was employed at a church, he was reprimanded for taking too long because he took a vacation for a month, but it, <laughs> you know, he was so drawn into that music that he, he definitely took his time on that trip. Um, now, when, in, in fact, one more thing I'm gonna mention about Buxtehude is that um, his, his influences were on Bach's organ music. For instance, um, Bach's um, organ toccatas, uh, toccata and fugue, uh, that we know, and we're going to play it in a second. But also, his keyboard variations called Goldberg variations, and, and now that's 32 variations in the key of G major. And guess what? Buxtehude also has a set of variations called La Capricciosa, uh, a capricious one. And that's also a set of 32 variations in G major. So um, that, that might be direct inspiration, it could be argued. But um, yeah, let's, uh, let's see this manuscript here. Now, this one in particular is not Bach's handwriting, but we're going to see Bach's handwriting later on. This one is, well, it goes like this.
very familiar music, but um, look at what it looks like in uh, uh, Box Day's manuscript writing. So you can see how all these um, smaller notes that, um, that, you know, all those little notes and those notes, all of the beams, as we call them, between the notes are actually curved. And, and in fact, today, with printed music, everything is straight lines. But back then, it was actually a sign of penmanship to provide nice curvatures. And, and the curvatures are actually helping you to play the phrase better, right? They, they go with the flow of the actual musical phrase. And, and we'll, we'll look at some box manuscripts, actually, that are, um, that are exceedingly great for penmanship. In fact, um, one of my teachers taught me the same trick in, in writing notes. She said, when you write the note, don't just do this and then write the stem. You kind of scoop it up or scoop it down for speed's sake. In other words, the quickest way to write notes is not like this, but like this and like this. Um, and I have used that for, for speedy writing, but what Bach did, he used quills, you know? So um, imagine trying to write precisely on, on a piece of music paper, and some of the music paper he actually lined up himself, the actual five-line staff. Um, to me, it looks like, we'll see that later too, um, looks like a, a, a five-quill arrangement of some sort that he used to draw the lines because the spacing is even, but the line itself might be a little wavy depending on Bach's mood, I guess. Um, so here, um, I'm going to play another piece for you. Let's, um, uh, we're gonna play this prelude from his cycle of pieces well known as the Well-Tempered Clavier. And before we play it, I'm just gonna give it a little intro um, for those who know or, or for those who don't know. Uh, it's always good to kind of refresh your memory on that. So well-tempered means in music theory that each space between the two adjacent notes, these and these and these and these and these, all of them, all of these spaces are equal. So it's also called equal temperament, all right? So here is octave, octave between the C and the C, uh, we call it pitch class. So between the note of the same name, we have this octave and it's, the frequencies are in the ratio of two to one. So this oscillates twice as fast as this one. Um, this is A440 hertz, as we call it. So this would be 880 and so forth. So equal temperament assumes all these same intervals, but it was not the case in the early days. In fact, um, the choice, choice of keys were limited because uh, people retuned their instruments or readjusted their string playing or woodwind playing uh, or singing based on what the p a piece of the key was. So basically um, you had only a certain number of keys that sounded good in that um, non-equal or just temperament. And then other keys sounded absolutely awful unless you retuned your entire rig. So Bach was actually a proponent of equal temperament. Um, and he wrote the well-tempered clavier. In fact, uh, he prefaced it with uh, a saying in German, but when I was looking at this, I don't speak German, I can understand kind of what it says. And, and I think what it says, if you simplify it, it says for the young music students and skillful musicians alike. Well, that sounds very much like something that Bach would write. In other words, um, it's kind of like our composer's lab here too. You know, we're going into some, some very simple things, but we're also going much deeper into something that may not have even occurred to, to some people as a relationship between a certain thing and a certain other thing. Um, so it's, it's an instructional work, but it's also, of course, a work of art. 24 preludes and fugues in each of the keys. And then, and then he actually it was such a great success with his students, they were asking him for more. So he wrote another book, the second book um, of another 24 preludes and fugues, brand new, but also in all 24 keys. So we're gonna play this piece in D minor. It's a prelude. And this is actually box writing. Now look at this. Oh yeah. So, so you see what I mean by, um, 
the flow of the beams, right? You can see how he literally accentuates. In fact, um, when I play it, you can actually hopefully follow the music and, and we're going to have the pages scroll so, so you can see and hear what's going on in Bach's mind as, as he wrote this prelude. And also listen to the flow of his musical speech. You know, this is something that we cherish Bach for. You know, a lot of composers wrote fast music those days um, or just something that's maybe um, that has some brilliance or it has some, some real, you know, speediness to it. But this one, um, besides being fast, it's also, it has this quality of like telling us a story, telling us what's going on. So let's hear it. <laughs> So you see how um, this story unfolds. Let's just uh, go back to the first page. So this starts here, just very simple, right? Just a pulse. And here it goes. Pretty nice, right? So very, very simple figures. But what he does with them is he starts literally developing, developing them. Um, so for instance, the figure becomes larger or smaller, like this, right? Or towards the end, um, you know, there's, there's a section here. So, so it builds, it has an ebb and flow, but there's this section here, right? Uh, To me, it almost sounds like, like a bird trapped somewhere, cannot escape, right? Uh, something that, that's throbbing and, and, and trying to escape, all right? And then, uh, as a response to that, comes this. So here's this inner voice coming in, right? It's almost like a voice of an elder or maybe even voice from above, something that is telling him, no, 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 you will not escape, maybe, or or not yet, right? And then, and then it really becomes dark here. Okay, and this is kind of point of no return. So we know it's gonna end right there. Okay, and then everybody leaves. And here is one character. Or perhaps, could that be grace falling down? What could it be? Um, these are all diminished chords, right? They, um, they have minor thirds in them, so they, they sound a little squished, you know? And, and in music, we normally use them when we want some atmospheric effects, you know, like this.
diminished chords. And that's what we have, a series of these diminished chords just falling down almost mechanically, almost um, too predictably, but uh, it's, it's, it's a visual. It's... Right? And then, of course, at the end, we have this resolution. Um, and notice that in modern editions, sometimes you will see um, at the end, you will see of a minor piece, you see a minor chord like this. So it'll end in the minor key. But here, we actually have specifically uh, proof that Bach did not want a minor key here. This is his own manuscript of his own work. And guess what it ends with? Major. And uh, now, in his times, there was um, um, a lot of in, in a, a lot of music theory in the air. We're actually going to talk about this a little bit later, but uh, let me also um, show you another piece from the same well-tempered clavier. For those of you who read music, you notice that um, on the grand staff here, the top line is the right hand, bottom line is left hand, and then uh, the top line is actually written in what we call soprano clef, not the treble clef. So if you're thinking you're looking at the wrong notes, um, just kind of take them, uh, you know, down a third um, in, in your mind and uh, you will get the right notes. It's this piece. Etc. So this is known as Ave Maria. Now Bach may have had that in mind. He, he did not write it as an Ave Maria specifically. It just says Preludium. But uh, later on the composer Charles Gounod actually added a vocal melody to this piece using Bach's piece verbatim, a note for note, as the accompaniment. And that now the piece that we know that goes with this is actually Bach Gounod Ave Maria, but what I'd like to show you is this. Uh, I was able to find uh, not an optimal quality, but good enough. I was able to find an actual sketch for this music. Here's what it looks like. All right, so first of all, yeah, the, the bass notes are in the right hand as well, but, but they're assumed to be played with the left hand because the stems point down, that's kind of like our code for, you know, use the other hand. Uh, look what he wrote though. All good. All good. All good. All good, then follow along the bottom staff. Ah, he skipped a measure. So he wrote this, right? And then he was going to this chord here. And then look at that insert, right in the middle right um, of the screen. You will see that he actually inserted that extra measure. So we get, and then we get this. And only then we go to this. And, and that, well, now we have the piece, you see? Uh, now, now when you have this, you know that the next one is going to be like this and so forth. So, so all of a sudden he found, found it, you know? And then the very ending of this sketch are actually some, some chords here. So that's probably uh, how he thought of, of like uh, ending the piece. It does end differently in the final version. But um, basically it's what we come to know as this right here. So that, that is his piece. Now, um, 
What's interesting is that during Bach's time, there was uh, a music theory that we now call the doctrine of affections. Doctrine of affections. Um, nothing to do with psychological affections, rather musical affections. So how different ways of writing musical passages affect us emotionally, and which musical devices or tools or ways of writing we can use to depict what emotion or state of mind or maybe a story plot even going from there to there. Um, so there are several quotes from this one book that uh, we know Bach actually read. Um, uh, I don't know if they met in person, but um, they knew about each other. Bach read um, his work. Um, his name was uh, Johann Matheson. Now, Johann Matheson, um, contemporary of Bach, wrote a treatise on affections. And he describes various states of mind and states of emotion. But um, this one I actually kind of picked out because I think it sounds very similar to what modern producers would um, tell us. Look at this. Anger, ardor, vengeance, rage, fury, and all other such violent affections are actually far better at making available all sorts of musical inventions than the gentle and pleasant passions which are handled with much more refinement. Yet, it is also not enough with the former, which is the angry and vengeant, not enough with the former if one only rumbles along strongly, makes a lot of noise and boldly rages. Not enough. Heard that before. Notes with many tails, and he means the beams and the flags on the notes. So faster notes have more beams and flags, more, you know, more busy, faster. Notes with many tails will simply not suffice as many think. But each of these violent qualities requires its own particular characteristics. And despite forceful expression, listen to this, must still have a becoming singing quality. So despite of all of that fury and rage, you still must not forget, and he finishes saying that, as our general principle, which we must not lose sight of expressly demands. So this is very interesting, and that's what we find in uh, Bach's music, is in fact that kind of treatment of, um, of affections to where um, even though the texture might be busy, was still here that singing quality of a melody. In fact, um, let's look at this work by Bach. Again, not Bach's handwriting, but the music will sound familiar. Etc. Okay, so that's a chorale prelude. Now, the actual cantus firmus, which is the chorale itself, the chant, as you will, as in Gregorian chant. So this would be a traditional church hymn that's sang in unison or some sort of an interval um, by the, the congregation and, and pretty much everybody, the choir and, and everybody else. So uh, right there on that page, if you can see, uh, right there towards the middle, there, is, um, there appears a middle staff. So now it's a group of three staff joined by a brace. And here's what that third staff, middle staff, shows us. So that is the actual church hymn. And how does he introduce it. Let's just play a uh, couple of measures before that. Here we go. Uh, now this counter melody, which is our main melody, starts repeating, but on top of that comes this.
so there is the chant and it kind of like a sneak sneaks up on you it, it, it literally just just comes in as if here's this what's going on here here's maybe box meditation maybe he's walking on a path somewhere and just meditating on on the blessings that he has and somewhere in the distance the chant is being sung It actually shows you how Bach would incorporate his own writing into traditional music. Now, one more piece I'd like to briefly show you is this one here. Look at this. This is full Hollywood orchestra. Wow! If heaven and earth rejoice in music, this would be that. So uh, he actually remade his violin piece into this um, and made it an intro to one of his cantatas. And, and so now you have this huge orchestra there by, by his times. Um, you have oboes, you have trumpets, you have kettle drums or timpanis, you have full string section and you have the organ soloing. So, um, interesting things about this score, and I'm just going to show you one page, but let's just um, look at this page a little bit, all right? So, the top part is three trumpets. One, two, three. Three staves. Um, the next one after that, and it goes with the trumpets. Whenever there are trumpets in, in that time, there's usually kettle drums. It's kind of like like the big sound, okay? So if you have trumpets, you have kettle drums, normally. And they together, right? You can, you can kind of imagine that, right? Da -da 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 -da. Well, I mean, that's pretty much it, right? Fanfares and big stomps. Okay, so the kettle drum part is the fourth line from the top. It just plays one note. And of course, for those who read music, you will see that the trumpets are notated in the key of C, all right? The kettle drums are notated in the key of C. Down below we have the solo organ part, and it's also notated in the key of C, okay? And everything else is notated in the key of D major. So what that means is that you have to have these trumpets that are tuned to um, D, all right? So when they see the note C, they play the note C, but the sound of it makes D. Um, same thing with the kettle drums. It simply means that this is the main tone. In this case, the piece is in D major, so the main tone would be D, and then the other tone would be A. So, typical kettle drum part, or something like this. Right. Um, but they're notated as C. Now, the organ, it, it's a very challenging part. I'm sure, you know, we know who played that one uh, uh, at the first performance, right? It's also written in C, and when I saw one of the performances, I kid you not, um, the organist actually retuned his organ, and that's probably how they did it back then. Uh, we don't see it very often today, but this one group in particular did it, to where, let's say, if I were to play it and see on the organ, just as written, without retuning anything, it would be... You see, I'm only using the white keys, you know, in other words, um, it's everything is written in the key of C, and there's probably some accidental signs, but everything is in C. So if you tune up the organ, instead of you get you get the correct key. And of course, now, each key has its own color, and Bach was actually, uh, again, proponent of that, because in equal temperament, all keys are well equal 
in that way so that there's no good key or bad key in terms of how they sound acoustically. Um, the only difference then would be how they sound perce perceptually, how we perceive them and what color they bring, you know, what part of the, um, the inner ear do they excite and what, what nervous um, impulses we get, literally if you get into the physics and psychoacoustics of it, of why that happens. So different key does have a, a different effect on us. And of course, in C major, well, that's very nice, but in D, it just becomes super jubilant. It just shows you, um, just Bach totally knew everything um, about what he was doing. And uh, last but not least, I would like to uh, mention that, of course, Bach had, um, this is his genealogical tree that they designed. So um, that would be like who led to, to Bach. But he also had very talented children. And uh, some of them actually became prominent composers, especially one of them, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach. Now, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach served at the court of King Frederick the Great. And King Frederick the Great actually commissioned Bach the musical offering piece. Here is, uh, in fact, um, Bach's son and King Frederick. Um, it's a painting, somebody took a photograph of it. Uh, I don't know where exactly it's displayed, but it's displayed somewhere. So here's what uh, the king gave him. Well, that's kind of a theme, right? And so Bach wrote a whole series of fugues on this theme and basically made uh, a masterpiece out of just um, something that somebody played to him on the flute. Um, but uh, yeah, the king was very pleased. And of course, uh, Bach's son continued working there. And um, also Bach's son wrote some keyboard treatises that were read by Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven and even Beethoven's pupil, Carl Czerny, who later became a composer of now famous etudes. So we have a tremendous legacy of Bach. Well, um, I'd like to end the presentation portion by showing you this amazing picture of Bach. Now, this is an engraving. I'm not sure when it was done. Um, this is also from the collection from the website Bach on Bach by Peter Bach. He expressly lets us use his photographs of these rare memorabilia. And um, with this, I'd like to end the presentation portion of our program and call on the open forum portion. So now the open forum is something that um, we are recently um, starting to introduce. Um, I've called some of the people that I work with in Orlando, where we live. These are all professional musicians. Um, you will see them on the screen in a second. Um, they're, they're being patched in right now. They're all remotely connected to us in the studio from their home studios. Um, you will see, of course, the keyboards and, and, and headphones. Um, let me introduce the guests from the right top corner of the screen. Julia Gessinger, she is from Germany. She, she's going to tell us hopefully something about Bach, Bach's legacy in, in Germany from her perspective. Then we have um, next to Julia is uh, Konstantin Dimitrov. Now he is uh, from Bulgaria and uh, he will probably tell us about the uh, European traditions of Bach as well and how he approaches when he teaches uh, school children about Bach's music. And then, um, last but not least, uh, Mr. Andres Roca. He is the founder and leader of the group here in Orlando called Nova Era. And uh, he is a great arranger and composer himself. He actually uh, arranges a lot of Bach's music and Mozart's music and other Baroque and classical music for his group, Nova Era, that plays um, Baroque music and classical music with a groove, as they say. So Andres will probably tell us about that. So let me just, um, I've briefly introduced them, but let me just um, please have each of you, starting with Julia, uh, briefly introduce yourself, whatever you want to tell us about you. And then 
Now, let's see if you have any comments or questions or ideas, each of you, about um, the class we just heard about Bach in general. Uh, let's try to be brief, of course. Um, the three rules of the forum, as we always say here, are decent behavior. That one is obvious. Um, we're trying to be decent, and we are. The second one is keep it brief, please, because the airtime is limited. And the third one is when you're finished with your thought, just pass it on back to us. Then let us know that, that um, you are ready for, for, um, for us to um, pick it up. So um, let's, let's see if we, uh, we can hear our participants. Julia? Hi, everyone. I'm Julia Gessinger. And uh, I'm a professional violinist with the Orlando Philharmonic and Bach Festival Orchestra. Um, I also am concertmaster of Orlando Contemporary Chamber Orchestra and Fernwood String Quartet. And um, I love playing with all my colleagues here, um, present Constantine, Andres, and, and Sergei. And um, yeah, my husband is also a musician and a uh, um, passionate filmmaker, and we record a lot for film and video. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically my life, where I'm coming from. Thank you, Julia. Um, well, let's hear from Constantine. Please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Constantine Dimitrov. I'm a professional violin player as well. I play with Julia at uh, Orlando Philharmonic and some other orchestras around, but mainly I'm concertmaster of Florida Lake Symphony and currently a teacher at Orange County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Konstantin. Uh, Andres? Oh, um, we have, uh, I'm sorry, we have, um, we, we, cannot hear, we cannot hear you, Andres. Uh, let's see if you can maybe uh, fix your microphone. We cannot hear you. How's it? Is it any better? Ah. Yes, we can yeah. hear you now. Okay, please go ahead. My name is Andres Roca. I'm an arranger, producer, and composer for Nova Era, as you mentioned. And I also run sound, uh, uh, do recordings from home. So I'm uh, happy to be here with you. Thank you, Andres. Uh, let's, uh, uh, I'm going to play um, video operator here. Let's uh, go back to Julia and let's see if we can have everybody full screen. Yes. Looks good. Um, Julia, please uh, tell us. I'm, I'm really, first, first of all, if you have any comments about the presentation, please, or ideas, questions, suggestions, um, that, and also within the same question, I, I really would like to know, um, you know, about your relationship with Bach, about um, the, the legacy in Germany, just broadly speaking. Um, and you know how you approach how you approach performing Bach. So these these two things. Um, well, um, thank you very much for having me on your composer's lap. I'm very excited to be here. Um, in Germany, um, Bach is very much part of our culture. As for, as a matter of fact, I am from Germany. I'm born in Stuttgart, Germany, and um, one of my first professional jobs was was with the Internationale Bach Akademie Stuttgart. Um, under the direction of Helmut Rilling. And uh, actually, Helmut Rilling's daughters and I um, took lessons with the same teacher, um, Friedrich Rüstig, who uh, was then the concertmaster of the Radio Symphony Orchestra. Um, and in my family specifically, music was always um, incredibly important um, because my grandfather, Julius Gessinger, was a composer, and my father was my grandfather's copyist. And what's so interesting is um, we live all in this uh, age of new technology. But when my grandfather was alive, he was uh, born in 1899. So he was born um, and uh, lived for most of his life without any of these technologies that we are enjoying today. Um, and so my father had to take my grandfather's manuscript and uh, turn it into a printable version of the music. And so when I was a child, I saw my dad working feverishly, writing all uh, my grandfather's music into, you know, into a very clean version. And then when I was a teenager, my, my, my father 
taught himself to use the computer so that he could finally do it on Finale and, and whatever music writing programs we have nowadays. So that was uh, very, it made a huge impression on me, of course. And um, the other um, cool thing is that uh, um, my, my father and my aunt um, brought it to my attention just recently that apparently um, my family in tree, uh, family tree includes um, um, ancestors of the family Bach. So apparently I'm uh, directly um, a, a descended somehow um, um, of Bach, which I'm sure is not so, quite so preposterous considering that Bach, as you mentioned earlier, Sergei, um, had many children. As a matter of fact, I think he had like what, around 20 children or something like that. So it's actually quite conceivable, conceivable that uh, um, one of those people, you know, um, as there's two names on that family tree that uh, have Bach in, in them. So, you know, it's quite interesting. And uh, so, of course, you know, I, I, I uh, grew up with my, um, my grandfather would make sure that all his kids and all his grandkids would learn instruments. So it was very clear from an early age that I would start violin. And, uh, of course, I... I love violin, and uh, um, yeah, that basically um, made uh, kind of I, I followed the path <laughs> into music. Wow, Julia! Wow, <laughs> um, you you did mention something like this earlier at at one point, but I didn't know you actually had uh, the family tree. You know, I probably want your yeah, auto yeah. autograph now. <laughs> <laughs> no, That's wonderful. My grandfather, yes, a picture I... of him. Oh. Yeah. And some, oh, that, some that, that is neat. That you, wrote, you know? <laughs> that yeah. is very cool. Uh, we, we never know who is walking um, around us. You know, we might yeah. have actually um, one of the drummers I played with, play with, uh, is a direct descendant of the poet Schiller <laughs> from, uh, from Germany, you know, who, who wrote the, the Ode to Joy text for, for Beethoven. So, yes, uh, you, you yeah. never know who's around you, Julia. That, that's so awesome. Fun fact, exactly. That's so awesome. <laughs> Uh, let's, uh, let's hear from uh, Constantine. Constantine, what I'd like to know is um, when a uh, couple of things. First of all, again, if you have any comments on the, on the presentation or any, any of that, uh, my broader question to you um, as, as being from Bulgaria and being from, from you know, the heart of uh, Eastern Europe, I don't know if I said it right, but um, I, I'd like to think that that's what it is. Uh, so um, what, how... How did people approach Bach um, where, when you played in the Bulgarian Chamber Orchestra, when, when you played solo, when you went to school there, when you grew up? Did, did people um, actually care about doing it authentically? You know, like as far as... Uh, or, 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 you know, all these things, like the, the little details. And then the second part of my question is, when you did that, what do you do now? How do you teach the kids that you teach? What do you teach them about Bach and, and the interpreting Bach? Oh, dear. So when I was uh, in conservatory, first of all, this uh, authentic uh, performance uh, wasn't the thing yet. In the late 90s, when I started working with Bulgarian Chamber Orchestra, this was just... Uh, starting so in terms of ornamentation there was always a lot of uh, discussions and to tell you the rest of i'm not sure who is right who is wrong because every day somebody comes with something new then at the time when i was studying the golden standard was uh, sharing the recording of back partitas and sonatas now I will tell you with this uh, periodically informed performances, uh, my favorite is uh, Isabel F uh, Faust. If you find her recordings, they're just unbelievable. Now, with all that said, there is no set standard on what to do with back, you know. <laughs> with, uh, with ornamentation, with everything, it's... It's really up at the end to the performer, <laughs> to the player, what you're going to do. And if you do it great, you could get away with it, <laughs> even if it's wrong. <laughs> 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 Bach left uh, plenty of freedom for the 
player for the musician who is going to play mm -hmm. and putting it in some kind of a mold or shape is not right mm -hmm. so yeah we need to follow some rules and in terms of rules you oh, you mentioned musical offering the last year at the sofia conservatory with a group of friends we tried to go and they told us to forget about it because it's not for our heads but we did it anyway mm -hmm. Then later here in Orlando, actually did it with uh, Julia's husband in the group performing. I'm really happy that you mentioned exactly this work. <laughs> oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, no, that's interesting. We, we all, um, I think everybody who speaks on the question of authenticity would, would, would pretty much kind of, kind of say what you said, you, you know, um, that it's up to the performer. Uh, what interests me as a scholar is um, just ways of, ways of uncovering this. It's it's almost like like lost art that we're we're trying to get to. But um, uh, thank you, Constantine. Uh, we have just a few minutes left in our broadcast. Andres, if you could just um, give us um, about a minute of your take on how you approach arranging Bach, what you look for, how you combine and recombine different parts of his works. Well, I agree with Constantine there is no real set standard. I believe in that uh, strongly. You know, uh, in general, Baroque music, really, you know, there were some rules, but uh, a lot was left up to the musician to interpret. Uh, as far as with what I do with the music, you know, I think I can, I speak for myself, but for a lot of people, Bach has always been the soundtrack of my life, whether I knew it or not. Uh, you hear it in pop music. Mm -hmm. You hear it in jazz. Uh, it's just a fundamental structure that our music that it's influenced all of music. Mm -hmm. So I see Bach more as uh, past, present, and future. So you, that's what makes it, in, in my point of view, uh, very easy to take his music and arrange it with a beat or rhythm. Something that a jazz musician can understand a pop musician, a rock musician, and then obviously a classical musician, uh, both rhythmically, melodically. There's so much there that it's a part of everyday life, whether we realize it or not. I, I just grab from that and uh, put it in a blender, so to speak, and very out comes uh, what we do. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Um, well, um, this is about all the time we have today. Um, thank you so much, dear Open Forum participants. Let me bring you all full screen. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Constantine. Thank you, Andres. Oh, we'll see you again in the real world very soon. Um, so this uh, wraps up our presentation. And uh, the end of our session today, I hope you learned a lot. We we'll look forward to seeing you again. On behalf of the Interactive Academy, we wish you happy composing.